You're watching Idea Me, a global podcast creator series and mentor program. I'm Rick Smith, the ocean's ambassador and oceanographer and aquatic chemist with Global Aquatic Research. Today I have John Englander. He's an oceanographer, author, renowned sea level rise expert who helps businesses and communities adapt to a rapidly changing climate. His best-selling book, High Tide on Main Street, Rising Sea Level, and the Coming Coastal Crisis has been listed by Politico as one of the top 50 books to read, and he has a new book coming out April 6th this year, Moving to Higher Ground and the Path Forward. He's the founder and president of the Rising Seas Institute and was previously the CEO of the International Seakeepers Society, the Cousteau Society, and the Underwater Explorer Society. John, very excited to have you on here today. I'd like to explore the relationship between humans and coastlines, and I would also like to take a deep dive into your history of oceanographic work and experiences. Great, great. So John, please tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you started this uh, very interesting and inspiring career in oceanography. Thanks, I'm glad to. My path is very unconventional, but I think more and more everybody's path these days is unconventional, so it's, it's perhaps uh, the normal now. I uh, studied, um, Earth science and geology at that time was called uh, in college and economics. And I was also a scuba diving instructor. And this is back in 1970 to, to kind of date me uh, or age me. Uh, the, um, and a course on the ice ages or the Pleistocene more properly, or paleogeology was actually the title of the course, uh, ancient geology, fascinated me because I understood for the first time that ice ages were a recurring cycle in Earth's history, and that as the ice sheets waned and grew, that um, sea level moved up and down 120 meters, about 400 feet. And that just kind of blew my mind, frankly. And then when I was diving in the Bahamas in the clear water, I was a diving instructor during summer breaks from college, I found an ancient sea level 200 feet underwater, and all of a sudden this clicked. Now, I didn't think it would change in my lifetime, but uh, fast forward, I mean, I had decades in the dive industry, actually, after I graduated college. And then I led a group to Greenland in 2007. Um, and it was there that it all kind of came together that I realized, wait a minute, we are seeing sea level change, or the early stage of it. And this is something that human civilization has not experienced. The last time sea level was higher was 122,000 years ago when it was seven meters or 25 feet higher than today. So that blew my mind, frankly. And I decided to write a book, but that took a lot more research. And I, um, somebody said, it's kind of like I, I was my doctorate course in effect, which I, I never did actually, but writing the book is like that, of course, as a thesis and getting it you know, um, reviewed and vetted. And um, that's been my path. It was kind of uh, one thing led to another as happens for so many of us. I'm very interested about your, uh, it, it, it sounds like you've spent a lot of your lifetime uh, diving and probably have a huge number of experiences. I'm really interested as an oceanographer, um, some of the work that you did with the Cousteau Society and, and Jacques Cousteau. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Cousteau, uh, he died in June 97. Um, I was very involved in the diving industry, which he helped create, but he'd kind of gone off on his own path for, for years. But we gave him an award. I was chairman of a group called Ocean Futures at the time, started by the diving industry. And um, I got Jock to come over to Orlando, Florida in January of that year. Um, and this is a culmination of, of some meetings we'd had where he was going to receive this award. We spent some time together, and to my surprise, he asked me to become CEO of the Cousteau Society, which was just something I never would have expected, but I sold my dive business in the Bahamas and uh, um, Jacques and I spent, I guess, three, three days, almost day and night talking to each other. And uh, unfortunately, by the time I started working for him, he was in the hospital and three months later after that, he, he passed away. Um, but it was a turning point in my life because he, here was a guy that probably taught more oceanography to more people than, than anybody else ever. Uh, as you may recall, I mean, he had this, you know, regular TV program that was just fascinating. And um, he had a great perspective because he'd been doing this for then 70 years. Hard to believe he died at age 87. And um, so it was a real privilege and inspiration and, and 
got me to think of the world differently. Um, you know, he had a he had a unique perspective, and I was privileged to uh, share some of that. I know from some of my own personal experiences uh, uh, diving. I'm a recreational diver as well, and you know, and 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 we will be talking about sea level rise today. But I'd just like to give a quick shout out to um, uh, diving in, in in coral reefs, and I'd just like to say that for me, they've been some of the best opportunities I've ha- ever had. Um, What is the current state of diving with some of the changes we've been seeing in the ocean today? Um, And once again, we're not going to go too much down this, but, you know, things like ocean acidification and warming, uh, just part of the the ocean changing as as we know it. And how are people adapting to that as as divers? Well, I'm not involved in the diving industry anymore. And in fact, it's been a year since I did my my last dive. So, I, I mean, I still dive occasionally. But having thousands of dives, mostly in the warm waters of the Bahamas, et cetera, but I've been under the polar ice cap and uh, been many places in the world. Um, Diving's changed quite a bit, but the magic of being weightless or, you know, the the exploration aspects of diving, I think will always be there. But the reefs have certainly changed, as you've just alluded to, the uh, uh, from the warming temperatures, from the the excess nutrients that we're putting in the oceans, the various diseases, pathogens that are getting in, the algaes, the changing ecosystem from, uh, you know, the, the demise of sea urchins, which were used to eat the, the algaes that suffocate the reef. So, and the, most of the sea urchins are gone. Uh, most reefs today are covered by this brown green algae or they're turned white from coral bleaching. There have been a lot of things happening to coral reefs, which um, were a really special aspect of the ocean for people like you and me um, and millions of people, of course, tens of tens of millions of people. The uh, Cousteau reminded me, uh, back to Jacques for a moment, that the coral reefs naturally died off five times in the planet's history as part of the great die-offs. And one of the things we have to realize is that our perspective of time is pretty narrow. Uh, You know, a few centuries or a few thousand years perhaps from records uh, or our own lifetime, you know, which is decades at at, at most. Um, and the planet has gone through some natural changes and sea level and the ice ages are a great example, which we're gonna get to, but we're now in a new era as we're gonna see. And so there were natural climate changes, there have been natural changes to the ocean like the coral reefs that had no, no impact by humans, but now we're in a new era. And that's what's critical to appreciate and put that in perspective, the natural changes, which are part of geologic, biologic history. And now what's happening now that's different, that's triggered by us? And how can we see that? And can we see where things are headed so that we can begin adapting while there's still time? So let's talk a little bit about the problem. We've got huge amounts of humans that live within a certain distance of the coastlines, and we have rising sea levels. Uh, Let's talk and explore a little bit about that problem. Can you frame it for us? And then we can start to talk about some of the science. Sure, in fact, I've got a few slides I've pulled together and I'll tell your viewers how to get a a set of slides at the end of this talk, um, because this may warrant them going a little bit deeper, but if I can, let me share a screen and and take you through uh, just four or five slides, which will give a visual to the, my description of how sea levels changed and what it means for the coastline. This, this is a, a, a NOAA graph, uh, colorized uh, just to show mean sea level scenarios for the year 2100 on the right-hand side. But it starts off with sea level going back to 18, 1800 uh, on, on the black line on, on the left. And it's, so it's a really big picture, but it's, it's for a couple of purposes. Sea levels been rising a little bit in the last century or two. That's the black line. But now we know that things are changing quickly. And we'll talk about Antarctica and Greenland in a minute, the source of the major rise. And um, there are different projections. And that's what those different colored lines show. And they show anywhere from two feet to eight feet from a little over 60 centimeters, you know, to I'll do both metric and and US units for for viewers um, up to a little over two meters. And that's a huge span, of course. And it's unprecedented is the, pick, is the importance here to understand. And we'll talk about why it's hard to predict, but why our tendency is to underestimate sea level rise. 
in the current era. Okay, so this looks back to the last ice age, which was 20,000 years ago was the peak of the last ice age. And it's pretty dramatic in what it's gonna tell us. Sea level was 390 feet, 120 meters lower than present. It rose not smoothly, not even in a smooth curve, but in a couple of steps. And the most recent one was 11,000 years ago when it changed slope rather quickly. And if we'd been in any of those yellow, three yellow arrows, the inflection points, and had looked to the recent past and thought we could predict what was about to happen, we'd be wrong because of the inflection point, the change in slope. And this is a really simplified diagram, but it is based upon lots of scientific data. Sea level got to the present level about 6,000 years ago. That's when it seems to have leveled off. And that's pretty much human civilization, if you think about it. The written record goes back about six or 8,000 years. So we've tended to believe sea level had stabilized, and for all appearances it had. But the purpose of this slide is to show that sea level has naturally changed almost 400 feet. Okay, if we melt all the remaining ice on the planet, we're going to raise sea level another 212 feet to give us a sense of what's what's at stake here. So let me just um, give a few other perspectives. Now, this chart will be in the set that I tell your viewers how to get at the end. It's a chart I put together. It's in both my, my prior book, The High Tide of Main Street, and in the new one, Moving to Higher Ground. It's 400,000 years from left to right. The present is on the right-hand side. The, the green graph is carbon dioxide, what we think of as a greenhouse gas, so color-coded to remember. Red is temperature or heat, again, easy to remember, and blue is sea level. And there's a few things to notice in this, that for 400,000 years shown here, and actually going back two and a half million years, there's been a natural change in all three parameters, carbon dioxide, ocean temperature, and sea level. And you can see the peaks line up, and they're rather evenly spaced between 95 and 125,000 years. That's because of a solar cycle, basically, or, or orbital variation, actually, the Milankovitch cycle. Without getting technical here, the point is that there was a natural reason why the Earth's temperature changed repeatedly for millions of years. It's about every 100,000 years. And it's about a 2080 split. So just rounding things off for simple numbers, the carbon dioxide rose, temperature rose, and sea level rose as the ice melted for 20,000 years and then fell for 80,000 years. And you can see that repeating pattern. That's without human influence. But now what's changed is in the upper right of this graph, the green line, CO2 has broken out of the 280 parts per million, and is now at 414 parts per million, 40% higher than in millions of years. And with that extra carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas as we call it, the temperatures are warming. And in fact, the red is starting to tick upward. And as the world gets warmer, the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica melt, and there's also thermal expansion of seawater, and because of that ice melting and because of the oceans just expanding slightly as they warm, sea level is starting to rise. Now what, what becomes quite clear with this graph is that there was a natural climate change that we think of as the ice age cycles, but now we've broken out of that, that the huge increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because of burning fossil fuels in the last century or two um, is starting to cause the warming that principle was proven in 1859, predicted even earlier than that. Uh, the, it's easy to demonstrate that carbon dioxide traps heat, and we are in uncharted territory, and sea level's rising. And if you think that these lines are going to stay in synchronization over hundreds of or thousands of years, therein lies the problem, because if temperature and sea level follow the green line at all, we are gonna see great flooding because these lines for a couple of different principles of physics tend to stay in synchronization, all three lines, as they have throughout geologic history. And uh, there's just a lag time for the carbon dioxide to cause the warming and for the warming to melt the ice and to raise sea level. 
So one or two more slides and then we'll get back to just kind of conversation. Two slides to show the increasing rate of sea level rise. Since we kept records in 1880, global average sea level has risen about 1.7 millimeters a year. That's about a sixth of an inch. But that rate has doubled in the era that we have satellite records of sea level starting in 1993. And in the last decade, the rate is now increased to 4.8 millimeters a year, almost triple what it was for the last century. So you can see by the changing slope there, designated by those dotted lines, that the, the angle of slope is increasing significantly. And as a final graphic, to take that, since we've had satellite sea level measurements, which have been only since 1992, um, we just launched the sixth in a series of satellites to, to do the precise measurement of sea level from satellites. But it, this line shows it quite clearly that starting from 1993, the rate was two millimeters a year, which would be eight inches a century if it just went straight line. Then it increased to three millimeters a year, which would be 12 inches over the course of a century. And for the last decade, it's at 4.8 millimeters a year, which would be 19 inches over a century. And just 19 inches this century would be hard to adapt to. But the problem is the increasing angle of slope, the acceleration. This line is not stopping. In fact, it's accelerating. Uh, the doubling time is shortening. And some people would say it's you know, gonna go for ex exponential growth. We'll see if that happens or not. But the clear point is the rate of sea level rise is accelerating and that has big implications for the coastlines to your question. Um, so that's kind of this, the, the graphic part of this talk. And um, I will give some contact information at the end uh, about how to get my slides, et cetera. Um, but knowing that sea level moves up and down naturally 400 feet is surprising to almost everyone. And that was again, not caused by humans. But now we have changed the composition of the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide is trapping more heat. It's measurable. We're seeing effects from more wildfires to more rainfall because the oceans are evaporating more. But the most significant physical single factor is that as sea level goes up foot by foot or centimeters by centimeters or meter by meter, I should say, um, that the coastline is going to move. And we're unprepared for that. But, and we don't see it because we're prepared to look for storm damage and, and um, extreme high tides, uh, king tides, uh, flooding from, from everything from storms to rain to runoff. And, but it's the incremental change of sea level per year, which presently, as I say, is on the order of a fifth of an inch. Uh, five or six millimeters, that uh, we don't see that. But it's like a drip filling the bucket. It's the accumulation. So we're talking about sea level rise. Uh, what, for people who live along the coastlines, it, there's this interesting disconnect where they're worried about how far the sea is going to creep in. And we're looking at rates at which it goes up. Right. So how can we transcend those two differences and what types of regions, especially around the U.S., are going to see the sea creeping, creeping into coastlines the most from this, this kind of rise? And how far can it come in from, uh, you know, even, even things like an inch or, or two of uh, sea level rise? Well, with an inch, we're probably not going to notice anything, frankly, but it's the accumulation. As I say, it's like the drip filling the bucket or the bathtub is a, you know, is a good way to think of it. The, uh, in terms of the metrics, um, and let's not limit it to the U.S. Let me, let me, since you probably have global viewers, let's think of this globally, even though we, we can designate the U.S. as well, that um, it's a bit counterintuitive that for each foot or meter of uh, higher sea level, coastal experts say that we can get up to 300 times the inland incursion. In other words, if, if sea level moves up one foot or 30 centimeters about, um, it could go in inland at 300 feet or 100 meters, rough, round figures, okay? That's huge. And it seems counterintuitive, but it depends upon the coastal topography, the profile. 
And so in places like Florida, it's one thing, but up through the Carolinas and even up into New England and around the Gulf Coast, we have a very shallow uh, slope. In places like California, we have uh, a, an abrupt slope generally, and, and so bluffs. So people there may be 30 feet above, but harbors and, and marinas are down at sea level, of course, or Navy bases, airports. Um, so there's huge vulnerability to higher sea level. And again, we tend to miss it because right now it's fractions of an inch and we're looking for the next 10 foot wave from a storm or even the extra foot of flooding from a high tide. But it's that drip, drip, drip filling the bucket. And it is going, it is changing and it is going to change. The other counterintuitive thing is that when you go inland, whether it's here in Florida or, or most places uh, on the southeastern United States, it rises pretty stoop, steeply in the, um, at the beach berm, the sand dunes. That's how coastlines build up. But then it falls off to the west of that, down to an intercoastal waterway or marshlands or up tidal rivers. And so the flooding doesn't first happen right at the coast like it does during a storm, uh, which is again counterintuitive. Uh, in many places, just 50 feet in from the water, you may be 20 feet up, up, but you're gonna go back down to sea level as you get out toward the Everglades here in Florida. But the same thing happens up through New England with the Cranberry Bogs and the, you know, or e even through the Carolinas with the, the swamp and, and, uh, and along the Gulf Coast. So it's all rather counterintuitive. We have this visual of sea level hitting the shore because of a storm wave that may be 10 feet high that's gonna cause erosion but it's the incremental erosion that happens without a storm that's changing the coastline. And sea level, again, has been pretty stable for 6,000 years. So it's not gonna change in our lifetime very much, but even if it changes a foot or two or three or four, a meter or so, that's gonna have an impact. And it will first be seen at docks and marinas and, and places where we're at a critical height, supposedly above high tide, that's already changing because at these extreme high tides following what's a 19 year tide cycle, um, I mean, tide goes daily and then lunar monthly and then uh, peak annual and then following an 18.6 year cycle for tides. So they're a little kind of um, magical on their own or mysterious, but sea level has not changed much in the thousands of years of human history civilization and so we got to think in different levels we've got to think about temporary flooding from a storm how a tide cycle seems to be getting higher but that's really reflecting that base sea level is inching upward and pushing the tide cycle upward and while the southeastern united states has more vulnerability from um, Seattle, Washington, to Vancouver, Canada, to San Diego, to uh, Marina del Rey in Los Angeles. We have coastal vulnerability all over the world. And there's some countries that have it even worse, from Vietnam to Bangladesh, to Indonesia, uh, to India, and um, parts of China. There's huge cities with, I mean, literally 15 or 20 million people that are not anticipating sea level rise in their planning. And uh, we need, my contention is we need to adapt in advance of the flooding because most buildings and infrastructure last a hundred years. And so you can't wait for the water to rise and then say, now we're gonna build everything five feet higher. Now is the time to start planning for higher sea level to come. Cause it's inevitable that melting in Greenland and Antarctica is getting faster and faster. I take a lot of groups there um, on fact-finding trips to, to Greenland to see what's happening. It's mind-boggling how big it is. I mean, it's the size of the eastern United States. It's got two miles of ice on it. Antarctica is seven times bigger than Greenland. But that's where 98% of the world's ice is. And if it all were to melt, sea level would be 212 feet or 65 meters above present. That would take at least 500 years to happen probably, maybe a couple thousand years but we couldn't tolerate even three meters or 10 feet of sea level rise at present. We need to start planning in advance. Yeah. 
And I've seen, uh, I've seen the devastation that even a few feet of rising, um, in this case, the Great Lakes, uh, which have seen some really high water levels and record levels in the past few years, I've seen the devastation that can do. And to people's personal property, to their homes, their family homes, uh, to businesses, the economy, industry. Um, so it, it really has um, all these kind of snowballing effects. Yeah, um, it's worth pointing out there, actually, I'm glad you brought up the Great Lakes because there's a lot of misunderstanding that even though we have ship going traffic to the Great Lakes, of course, there's over a dozen locks that allow boat ships to get from sea level, you know, through the St. Lawrence Seaway and up to uh, Lake Ontario and up, you know, as far as Lake Superior, I guess. The Great Lakes are between 250 and 600 feet above sea level. We tend to forget that. And although there is some height increase in the water level, as you just pointed out, Rick, uh, as you know, that's, that's either from more rainfall, which we're getting through more evaporation on a warmer planet, or perhaps melting glaciers in some places that, that's happening all over the world from there to the Himalayas, uh, to the Alps, in a, again, in a warming planet. So lake levels are changing a little bit, and that's certainly an issue, but they're gonna be much more stable than sea level because lake levels, I mean, I don't think you're gonna see more than um, a foot or two rise, you know, this century, I mean, maybe a little more, but sea level could be 10 feet and, and accelerating. And I think that's really interesting and it goes back to what you were talking about coastal planning. Um, something I wanted to get into, and I know we got many layers to, uh, to unravel here, uh, when we're thinking Great Lakes, uh, we're still looking at an overall alteration of the hydrologic cycle, but we're seeing it um, manifest itself in different ways, changing precipitation patterns versus what you were talking about, large amounts of sea ice coming from Greenland and coming from Western and possibly Eastern Antarctica and, um, and, and adding to uh, the total volume of water uh, in the ocean. Um, and I assume that there are also very different planning strategies. So in the Great Lakes, we tend to get uh, high water on the order of every 25 to 30 years. And so you have devastation during that time and then it goes back down again. And then you've got kind of a period of time and then you wait another 25, 30 years and it goes back up. And, I, and, and there's also these overarching management levels in terms of how much water do we let, say, you know, out the Moses Saunders Dam. Uh, obviously, there's not a, a, you know, a dam in management for the ocean where we can do anything about this volume of water in, the, uh, in there. So let's think about planning. Um, what the, 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 you, you have, I mean, you have people's personal lives, you have econ economic activity, you have industry. I mean, not only do people live on the shoreline, but we also, I mean, there are a lot of power plants on the shoreline because, uh, you know, water intakes for uh, cooling and things such as that. So what's kind of your general overarching strategy or message? Is it just about moving inland? Is it about hardening our shorelines? Or is it about some mix of strategies that are tailored to uh, the specific regions that are going to adapt? Uh, what does this involve? The, the latter, that definitely um, different places require different adaptations. And um, it's gonna range from uh, building things higher, uh, in some places, seawalls, in uh, putting some cases, putting things on floats. It's going to take a whole new attitude of engineering in the coastal environment. Uh, fortunately, back to the lakes for just a moment, lakes are going to be again, relatively stable, lakes and rivers. And I think there's going to be a, a, a resurgence of interest and values and shipping and commerce back into the places like the Great Lakes, because they're going to be relatively stable compared to what's happening in the ocean. The idea that the ocean will be meters higher, let's just take um, three meters as a good uh, place to, to think ahead to, that's uh, 10 feet roughly. Um, that's gonna change coastlines big time. The Great Lakes will be unaffected by that, of course, uh, and nor uh, other lakes around the world. Um, there are places we're gonna probably build huge dams to try and control ocean level, but those will be massive projects. But the simple fact is that as we saw in one of those earlier graphs I showed, sea level moves or ocean height moves up and down regularly 120 meters, 400 feet. Whether we get 10 or 20 feet this century, we'll see, and it partly depends on what we do with restricting greenhouse gas emissions and how we make our, our energy from fossil fuels. Um, but there's enough heat in the ocean already that even if we want 100% to renewable energy today, 
never burned any more petroleum, natural gas, or coal, we're still going to get sea level rise because we've already warmed the oceans, as you know, one degree Celsius roughly, which is almost two degrees Fahrenheit. And that extra heat in the ocean means that the ice sheets on Greenland and Antarctica will get smaller. And as they get smaller, sea level will rise to heights we've just never experienced as a society. So we do have to start planning in advance because it's everything from building codes, um, ingenuity, I mean, uh, perhaps, you know, there, there'll be technologies about building, uh, methods of building and materials uh, to deal with the corrosive environment uh, as we put more things on floats, perhaps. Um, but for all of human civilization, we've assumed that sea level was a benchmark. You know, we talk about the height of property above or below sea level, right? I mean, as if it's a datum, as if it's a zero point, as if it's unchanging. Well, we've already seen in the last 30 years that it's changing, you know, and the whole concept that sea level is not a ref standard reference point like a surveyor's marker, but itself is changing, is a really challenging concept from surveying to property rights, to what you're financing, banks, to how you design things. And we're, we're not thinking ahead yet because, um, take an example, when you design a bridge, you figure out how many cars or trucks can be on it, figure out the weight, and you decide what the total weight load of the bridge is, and then you add in a big factor of safety, uh, usually double or, or more the weight load that you calculate for the bridge. We're getting confused because we're saying, well, we know that sea level is gonna rise at least um, a meter, let's say, and think we're gonna to design to that. That's dumb. We need to be designing, if you're not sure if sea level is gonna rise one or two meters, you better start designing for three because you need the margin of safety because we're building everything on the coast from nuclear power plants to oil refineries, as I think you mentioned, but to homes and businesses and ports and harbors and marinas and um, power plant, you know, cooling systems and things like that. These things last for at least 50 years, in most cases, 100 years. You look around town and find bridges and, and aqueducts and, you know, and, and, and uh, water systems and things like that. Those were started, you know, a century ago, typically. And so we've got to get ahead of the curve. And we're talking about real long-term planning, right? So we don't have to continue to do things over and over and be in this constant state of, of, of reacting to these big changes we're seeing. Um, and it requires, I assume, local, state, and federal governments the whole way to come up with a, a concerted plan. If you have, uh, say, an apartment block in New York City that is protected by a large wall, um, you know, what, what does it matter if all your neighbors get swamped out? I mean, we want to protect, uh, say, Manhattan. Right. Um, so how do you how do we start to bring this together? How do we offer um, how do we offer incentives? Uh, how do we protect uh, the individual experiences, uh, homes and businesses uh, while, while we adapt to this? Um, and I know it's a mix of strategies and it's based on the area. And this should also be mixed together with reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, I assume, because that will overall extend out how long our planning will be good for or how fast we need to adapt. Um, so what, what are the types of incentives that you can give um, uh, coastal communities uh, in order that is, in terms of just being a threat, this can either become an opportunity for them um, or it just kind of lessens the blow of, of what it's gonna take to do this? Yeah, all good questions and there's a lot wrapped up there. Um, so in terms of the incentives, the first thing we've got to start with is an awareness of what could happen. And hardly anybody appreciates the range of sea level that's happened historically and what we're now seeing happening faster and faster because of the melting of Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, we, we need to get our, our uh, a, a growing, a, a common awareness of the magnitude of what can happen. Because I don't think it's all officials. I don't think it's just government that has to deal with this. The government will adapt better when the people understand what's at stake here. And right now, most people either think climate change is a hoax, as we've heard, uh, or some people think that. But 
or they think that if we just get plastics out of the ocean or deal with other environmental things that somehow climate change will go away, and that's not true, or they think that if we do the very important work of getting off fossil fuels and slowing the rise in greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, that that will stop sea level from rising, and that's not true because we've already stored so much heat in the ocean. So the first thing is we need, without getting scientific about it and detailed, we need a growing awareness in the public that even at the current heat level of in, increased heat level, we're going to melt a lot of ice and the sea is going to rise. It's kind of analogous to nobody has to tell you every day or me every day that I could live another hour or another 40 years, which is the truth. Okay. And I could go and get a life insurance policy and I'll say, I've got, you know, 26 years probably, probably to live or whatever the number is. We all seen those projections. But we know that life's unpredictable. And we plan accordingly. We buy life insurance, we do estate planning, we, you know, we do things to take care of our family so that if something tragic happens to us tomorrow, right, that, that we, we understand that. The government doesn't do that for us. We do it because we know the realities of life. Well, the reality of sea level is that we can't predict it exactly. We do need to get off fossil fuels and slow the warming or it's gonna get really catastrophic. But we need people to understand that sea level being stable for the last few centuries or thousand years has been unusual and that sea level moves up and down greatly. The more that people understand and can separate sea level from what's in the Great Lakes or the Mississippi River or, you know, other, or the Thames River in London or, different, uh, or Indonesia's rivers, that um, the more people get a little science education and realize that there was a natural climate change called the ice ages. It's been a repeating cycle for 2.58 million years of Earth's history. We know that. There's no, there's no doubt or speculation about that. But we're in a new era and we've got to get off fossil fuels as soon as possible, hopefully putting a price incentive in there. We've got to prepare to be more resilient for more wildfires, more high temperature days, more heavier rainfall that all go with a warmer planet. That's being resilient. And then this one feature, sea level, which determines the shoreline. As sea level goes up, the shoreline goes inland. Um, that because we were fooled into thinking sea level was stable until 20 or 30 years ago, and now it's accelerating, we've all got to talk this new reality. And as I say, it's I hate, you hate to think of that we're going to die, but we're all going to die. And so we enjoy life. We do good things during our lives. We take care of our family, but we do make preparation knowing the uncertainty of life, right? Uh, for our responsibility and our community and our, and our family. And sea level is a little bit different than that. But the fact is, once we realize that sea level has moved up and down 400 feet, 120 meters, and now it's rising faster and faster, now is the time to bring this into architecture and engineering and uh, planning departments and uh, law and finance. I mean, even a 30-year mortgage may have to re be reevaluated for rising sea level in some places, particularly in places where the land is going down so sea level is rising. I should explain this. As you know, in some places the land subsides, it's either compacting or the plates are, are tilting a little bit or it's because we're drawing uh, water and petroleum out of the ground, which further causes it to compact. But places like New Orleans or Venice, Italy, or uh, Norfolk, Virginia, or Jakarta, Indonesia, the land is going down. And so sea level appears to be going up faster there because the land is going down. And there's a few places like the Northern latitudes from Alaska to uh, Scandinavia where the land is actually coming upward or uplifting. So that affects the perception of sea level. But global sea level is rising right now about a fifth of an inch a year. But it's the acceleration, as we discussed a minute ago. And we can see where this is headed. It's just that the, the challenge is it's not in our lifetime to, to, to or not in, the, in, in human time frames of year to year that we can see it easily. But here's the exciting thing, because I know one of our questions was, you know, what does this mean for, for young people and careers? In a way, it's really exciting. We get to reinvent architecture and engineering and, and what to put on floats and uh, coastal infrastructure and ports and transportation systems with this new challenge. 
and we're going to have decades to do it, but we really need to get started. But it means that lots of professions are going to need to reinvent themselves in purely as a result of, of unstoppable rising sea level. And that, and that makes total sense, John. And um, you, there are reminders all around of how high sea level has been, right? I mean, you can go, this is not something that I need to show you a detailed chemical analysis. I mean, you can go to the shores of islands in the Bahamas and you can look up at coral reefs that were once some amount of feet underwater. Sure. Now, you can find shark's teeth, you know, that are now on cliffs a couple hundred feet above sea level too, is a common example. But there's even marine sediments at the top of Mount Everest, by the way, which most people don't know. But, but so the other thing you have to take account is that mountains have been built up and, and land has uplifted too. So you've got to back that out, but you're quite right. right. Yeah. We can see even with adjustments for tectonics and, and uh, uplift, we can, we can back, back out of that what the depth was when the sediments were laid down. And yes, it's quite clear that, that sea level has been up and down over, over history. Yeah. And, and that's part of the rigor of the scientific process is, is taking everything into account and, and extracting the, uh, the signal from it. Right. Um, and so, and, and I like the kind of pragmatic uh, uh, approach as well, planning for, you know, T taking these risks into account and planning for variability. Now, if I am, say, a city planner, do I, so are we looking at planning for the absolute worst case scenario, for example, say I've got, say I'm going to plan to 2100 and I've got a range of variability that I, that, that uh, the science tells us that sea level rise is going to be superimposed on top of that, I've got things like uh, hurricane intensity and frequency. So do I plan for that once in a hundred year scenario with the strongest hurricane we might expect in a hundred years on top of the most sea level rise? Or is it some sort of risk assessment in the same way that you said we do with insurance and things like that? And is that, is that all stuff that still has to be learned and talked about and incorporated in, into how we do things? Is, is that all been decided? Great. A couple of questions, good questions there. So first of all, we should think of flooding as what I like to say is five kinds of flooding. And um, I do them in order of storms because we all visualize a hurricane or, or a typhoon hitting the shore with the big waves. Rain, we're getting more rain as there's more evaporation from the oceans. Rain comes down and it could be five inches or, you know, five centimeters. And, uh, but then it goes downhill and it can multiply. So that's runoff downstream runoff or just down slope runoff or even to the lower street in Miami. Um, so there's storms, rain, runoff, then tides, which are un, not weather related. They're, they're based upon the pull from the planets and they go through a daily lunar monthly and then 19 year cycle. So the extreme tides, we're seeing sea level rise manifest in high tides because of the fifth factor, which is sea level rise. So we have storms, rain, runoff, tides and sea level rise. And then there's erosion, which is a bit different, but we tend to confuse all those things. So for planning purposes, back to your question, we've got to look at all of that because you don't want your house to flood at the simplest level, nor your restaurant or your subway or, or anything else on the coast. We've always taken what we thought was the worst case, but sea level was stable. Now, if you're planning for a hurricane or an earthquake, you don't plan for a medium one. You know, that would, that would be dumb, right? I mean, uh, so he said, well, we, you know, we think we could have a, a category one to five hurricane, so we'll plan on a three. Uh, you get fired pretty quickly, right? Uh, uh, we tend to, to planning for risk, a worst case scenario with a margin of safety on top of that typically. Now, the idea that sea level's rising is a new parameter. We need to plan for the worst case, but, we don't know whether we're going to get one to three meters of sea level rise this century, and that's going to depend on how successful we are getting off fossil fuels. So back to your very good question, if you were a planning director, whether it be Miami or New York City or San Francisco or Portland, Maine or Portland, Oregon um, or Calcutta or anywhere else in the world, what should you plan for? I think you should do one of two things. You should either plan for the reasonable worst case, which to me is three meters, 10 feet, but that's a really daunting challenge in some cases. Or you plan what we call adaptive engineering. You say, well, okay, I'll plan for a meter, 
but design it so the foundation of the seawall or the building or whatever allows me to modify it later if things keep continue to get worse. In other words, you can build a you can build a 10-story building a floor at a time if the foundation is right. If you knew up front that you might build a 10-story building, right? You can build it as, as you need to add layers. The seawall is the same thing, but you've got to know up front to design the right foundation. Otherwise, you've got to tear it all down every time. And it is, you know, it's it's better to raise something three feet one time than to raise it one foot three times. It's a lot cheaper, but it's also disruptive for a community. So you've got to look at everything from what kind of community we're we talking about. Is this a residential street or a shopping street with retail, or is it a port with big concrete wharves? And it doesn't really matter if we just, you know, get a little more aggressive about it. So the situation will dictate our attitude. We should plan for relative worst case scenarios, but where we can't allow for future adaptability, adapt, you know, uh, adjustment of the engineering. And then there's some things we can put on floats or there's houses in the Netherlands in one place where they know they're gonna get flooding temporarily. And so they have put the houses where they, they've designed like to be sh short term houseboats where they, they, they float up and the, the power and water and uh, wastewater all comes through an umbilical. Uh, so the houses may float for 20 days a year during extreme high tides and then they settle back down on the ground. So there's lots of creative things we're gonna come up with, but I, just like with life insurance or something else to use the other metaphors I, or, her, or um, earthquake planning, it's better to plan conservatively and we're not doing that. And there is precedent in the US, uh, even dating, um, you know, before kind of more recent planning and recent engineering things like we've seen uh, up in the Netherlands or what they're planning, say, um, in, in um, off the course, coast of New York City, we've seen dating back to over 100 years ago, large changes in coastal adaptability. Um, I don't know if it's um, uh, something you'd want to go into, but what happened down in Galveston Island, where in the early 1900s, it was the most destructive uh, natural disaster in U.S. history, and they literally picked up old uh, churches and buildings and built the island up a certain amount of feet and placed a big seawall. Uh, I was living in Texas when Hurricane Ike hit, and we had a lot of uh, refugees, um, fr friends of ours who their homes were flooded up to the second story, and they lived closer to the bay, which hadn't been built up in the same way, and so they actually flooded from the bay side. The seawall and the extra height they added to the island did its job and protected most of the economic center of that island. Bolivar Peninsula, the next, um, uh, uh, the next barrier island, um, to the east that had not been built up uh, over a hundred years ago was completely wiped clean. Um, yeah, no, great example. Galveston, as you say, a hundred years ago, because of that terrible hurricane, they erected a 17-foot seawall and raised essentially every building in downtown Galveston 17 feet, and it's given them a lot more resiliency. Um, um, you know, there's other, there's a few other examples we can cite. I mean, Seattle did the same thing in a part of downtown Seattle also about a hundred years ago uh, because the land was sinking and they realized that the flooding was just getting worse. And so they built everything up 22 feet higher. So there are places like that, but that won't work everywhere, particularly where you have porous rock, like in South Florida or the Bahamas or most, most coral based islands. Um, the porous limestone, as you know, it allows water to infiltrate in through the rock. And so building a seawall uh, won't work, but we can build the land height up higher. But we can't, if you look around the world with the 8 billion people almost we have, you can't build all the land up higher to compensate for sea level being higher. We've got to start looking into the future. I mean, it's one thing when the land is subsiding and getting a little more flooding or it's inch by inch. Well, for the first time in human civilization, we need to look ahead to sea level being at least a meter, if not three to five meters higher. And we it, it's daunting, it's scary, but you know what, it's a great challenge. And the fact that it can happen tomorrow, that it's gradual, is a blessing. We literally have time to engineer a new coastal environment and it's gonna um, 
provide great opportunity for young people because whereas engineers and architects and all the other professions I've mentioned, they may thought they knew how to do things right. This new truth, which is gonna be more of an issue for young people who are gonna live another 60 or 80 years, right? Um, get to reinvent professions. And that's exciting because we may have thought everything was invented except for electronics and technology. But the truth is basic coastal design engineering, utilities, um, ports, airports, military bases, we have to rethink it all. I mean, this new reality to, to recognize that sea level has moved up and down 400 feet. And I don't think I pointed it out with that prior graph, but the maximum natural rate was about 4.7 meters. That's about 15 or 16 feet in a century. That happened without human intervention. Now that we have better geologic history, uh, you know, we start thinking about that. You either say that's the scariest news or how fortunate that it can happen tomorrow, like a summit some people has happened, you know, about 20 years ago. Um, sea level rise can not happen that quickly because it takes a while to melt the ice sheets, but the reverse is true. You can't stop it quickly either. So we have decades to adapt but we can't keep kicking the can down the road and delaying it. We have to start adapting as soon as possible because building codes and um, roadways and tunnels and, and train systems and, and electrical distribution systems are all oriented to a flooding height. And we think of floods as being storm, rain, runoff, dams breaking or rivers overflowing. Um, we're seeing a little bit of sea level rise, but it's just the beginning. It's just the tip of the iceberg, as they say. Um, and by the way, I should point out, just as an example of how much we all have to learn, we think of icebergs, everybody's seen icebergs, you know, they're about 10% out of the water. As icebergs melt, they don't affect sea level. And that's a surprising fact to people. Um, an iceberg, again, floats roughly 10% out of the water, but as it melts, it actually compress, uh, compacts, uh, ice is less dense than water, as you know, and, and that's why ice floats on lakes and things like that. But as a result, a, a floating iceberg or an ice shelf that's floating on the water, that doesn't affect sea level as it melts. It's the ice from land that either breaks off into a new iceberg, that's like adding an ice cube to a glass and does raise the water level, of course, or the melt water from land or the thermal expansion of seawater. That's why sea level rises, not because of icebergs or ice shelves melting. And thanks for clearing that up, John. I, I think that is a really important um, clarification. I, I've seen the misconception of the ice cube melting in the glass, but we're, what we're talking about is adding a second ice cube, right. not allowing the one that's already in there uh, to melt. Right. And um, what, uh, you know, I know we've talked about a, a lot here. Um, I would like to mention really quick or talk about something really quick. And that is this concept of, of living shorelines. I, I, I've seen it up here in the Great Lakes. I've seen it on the Atlantic coast. Um, we have natural, uh, we have natural uh, kind of uh, flood control systems, right? And these are things like marshes, wetlands, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and natural sandy berms and things like that. And I know that one thing that we're really concerned about is Will marshes keep up with sea level rise? Can they trap enough sediments that we will still have these coastal features? And, and that's important because then can we build uh, constructed wetlands that will help to keep up with sea level rise? Can we do constructed berms and can we plant, say, native vegetation on them that will keep those berms together and make it look, instead of seeing a seawall, you're gonna see a, a berm with natural vegetation. Um, is, is this a possibility or is the rate of sea level rise such that we really need to look towards uh, hardened shorelines, uh, you know, speaking specifically of, of say the US Atlantic coastline? So I, I think it's, it's all of the above to, to some degree. What I mean by that is um, I, I certainly think the natural shorelines from um, marshlands to mangroves to, uh, they call them horizontal levees in some places, things where as opposed to a hard uh, seawall structure, you know, and putting a building right in the water, 
that's a good idea, certainly. It gives us flexibility. Uh, the natural vegetation or even oyster shells or oyster beds are used in some places uh, can absorb energy and are not as sensitive to a little bit of flooding as you know a, a built structure a building or or roadway or um so so it's the natural systems are great but to your second point when you look at the the ability of a natural system like the everglades for example to grow to keep up with the rate of sea level rise. It can happen at present when we're in this couple of millimeters a year. But as sea level gets to that meters a century, which is you know tens of centimeters, natural systems can't keep up with it. So we've got to do both. I think we need more and more natural ecosystems on the shore to be adaptive, but we can't believe that that's the solution to adapt to sea level rise because of this acceleration. As I showed in that chart, looking back over the last century, it was 1.7 millimeters a year. That's, you know, I don't know, a tenth of an inch, roughly. Um, the rate doubled since we like data since 1993. The rate almost has doubled again in the last decade. So we're on this accelerating growth. It's like high interest rates. You know, they'll con the compounding of interest, if, if you've ever looked at, you know, what happens with savings or, or financing and stuff, if you're at really high interest, it gets away from you pretty quickly. And we're in duration mode. We need natural systems, um, more, the more the merrier. We need to slow the warming to slow the change. But we got to realize that just because of the heat that's already stored in the ocean, which is an enormous amount of heat, that uh, to warm the oceans, almost two degrees Fahrenheit, one degree Celsius, that the ice is gonna melt faster and faster. And it's, a, it's kind of an escalating or accelerating curve. The natural systems won't keep up with it sometime by mid-century. So now is the time to change the building codes as well as implement the natural barriers. And this increase in rate is um, primarily due to uh, feedback mechanisms that are inherent in how the earth uh, switches climate? It's both feedback mechanisms. That's, I mean, that's certainly part of it. But if you, if you apply a lot of heat to ice, it doesn't melt instantly. And we've applied, you know, we've warmed the oceans again, roughly one degree Celsius, 1.8 Fahrenheit, uh, roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. And the ice sheets on Antarctica and Greenland are collapsing year by year. But even with lots of heat in the earth system, the ice doesn't melt tomorrow. It does, you know, it's like taking a big block of ice and putting it on your kitchen table. If it's a big enough block, it'll be there tomorrow. It'll be a little bit smaller, but um, it takes a while to melt ice. Now remember, the ice on Greenland and Antarctica is over a mile thick. In fact, someplace it's two or three miles, several kilometers thick. And we're finding caverns the size of Manhattan now underneath these ice sheets. Um, these are hidden features that are rapidly deteriorating. And there's a delay time or lag time from applying the heat to seeing the effect. You can, you can do that experiment at home. You can take a pot, a big pot of water, put a bunch of ice in it, let the water cool down, you know, and uh, it'll melt slowly once the water has gotten cool. But then turn the heat up for a second, turn the burner up on your stove, just leave it till you see the ice start to melt quicker, turn the heat off. The heat that we've put in the water from our stove is gonna have an effect to accelerate the ice melt for a long time after you turn the heat off. There's a thermal lag time. And um, you know, it makes sense when you think about it like that. We've got, we've got a block of ice. Antarctica is seven times Greenland in terms of ice mass. Antarctica by itself is far larger than the United States covered by a mile of ice. And so we've applied heat and it's melting faster. But even if we turn the heat off now, we haven't seen the result because there's a lag time to melt the ice. Just as if you put a giant block of ice on your kitchen table, um, it will take days for it to melt. But here we're talking decades or centuries. There, there's so much to talk about here. Um, each one of these things we've talked about can then be uh, um, taken and 
a bunch of different ways. And we could probably talk all day about the science and adaptation strategies. And, and those are conversations I would love to have. Let's, let's wrap this up for everybody. We're, we're framing, we, we know about this threat. We know that we need to plan as we do for other things uh, in the long term. And we know, as you mentioned, that the key to all of this is kind of a bottom up, uh, making sure that people know uh, what's going on, to make sure that we do the outreach um, with, with, with science and what it means for uh, coastal communities, but really even non-coastal communities, right? Because everybody's dependent on what happens along the coastline because of industries and, and how many people live there and, and things like that. So let's wrap it up. If I am a, if I am say a homeowner and say, you know, say this is a, a family home that's been on the coastline, it's in a relatively low lying area and I'm starting to be concerned about this and I have, and I have educated myself and I know that, um, the, the ocean's gonna continue to creep up onto my property and erosion is a big issue. I'm just waiting for the next storm and I don't know if that's what's gonna you know, uh, do it or if I'm gonna have another 10 or 20 years. Um, what? Or if I'm a business owner in the same situation or say um, a city council member trying to advise people and now I've educated myself, what is the next step that I should be focused on? Uh, what's kind of the take-home message uh, for individuals who are, who are trying to take this and, and work it into their, into their lives? So the first thing is to do a vulnerability assessment. And you can either hire a professional to do it, or the truth is you can, you can begin to do it yourself in most cases. Uh, how close is the water getting to your property or your threshold of your door or lowest window during the worst you know, flooding events? And knowing that sea level is going to rise and storms and rainfall are tending to get worse, you can take a precautionary view. You don't want to wait till you have flooding to make plans to either improve things, elevate things, or move. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Because once your property is flooded, its value has gone down considerably. And surprisingly, it doesn't take the property submerging for it to lose value. Even if your property floods one day a year or three days a year. It, nobody wants to, to pay that much for it, right? Uh, if it's in a flood zone. But even if your property hasn't flooded, but the one a little bit lower than you is flooding and the water has been coming gradually uphill, okay, um, peop, your, your property is already being discounted in value because if you live in a neighborhood where there is increasing flooding, people are aware of that. So property loses value, certainly when it's submerged, but when it floods frequently, even one day a year, and actually if it's in a low-lying coastal area, just as the water gets closer to it. So those discounts are happening already in some cases. Some people are already either lifting their property or um, moving or elevating houses. There's a whole industry of lifting houses up and building a higher foundation. So there's a lot of different approaches and you've kind of got to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. The, um, but the time to do it is, is sooner rather than later for obvious reasons, because there is a discounting that's already been documented of properties that are vulnerable to flooding. Now, the, the, the solution for you may be as simple as, as closing in a, a, a basement window opening. You know, that, that may give you a much better situation. Uh, it, it may, there may be some ways to reduce the flood potential of your property but there may be a way to raise the house entirely. As I say, that's becoming more and more common. But at some point you may move to higher ground and uh, there are people doing that already because they wanna, they wanna sell while the market values are high. Everybody's gonna decide for themselves, you know, what their vulnerability to risk is, what their age is. I like to say, you know, if you're 60 years old, you may wanna do it now, not when you're 80, you know, even if it's a ways off because you gotta decide where you are at your point in life, uh, your family issues and all that, and your health, and, and just how vulnerable you are to a decrease in your property value. So this is great, John. I appreciate you talking about this stuff because these are things where we're not just as a society just waiting for, say, a seawall to, sea to be built 
these are things that I can wake up and say, yeah, I'm concerned about this. And uh, these are the first few things that I, that I might want to do. Maybe there's a few small things I can do to give myself some breathing room in the short term. And then there are some planning strategies that I, that I need to start to take. And if that happens with um, larger, say, urban planning superimposed on top of that, and just a, a changing mindset among society as we get educated, is that kind of how it will happen? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, in my, actually, my new book, Moving to Higher Ground, by the way, there's a checklist for people to go through with their properties. I think it's 18 point checklist. So I, I should just put a plug in there for that. But um, this is a, a, a personal issue. It's a community issue. It's for your family. And as you say, rising sea level is going to affect everything. Even if you live in Denver or Switzerland up in the mountains, um, the global supply chain is affected. And so your company, whether it be Walmart or uh, uh, you know Costco or whatever, the um, the goods may not be interrupted during storm events more often. Um, there are port cities today that are not going to be port cities 50 years from now, and the people who can see the future can reduce their risk and perhaps even benefit. And but as I say, most fundamentally, we've got to get educated about this. It's a very um, challenging concept and disturbing concept. Um, we've never had significant sea level rise in human history. We, it's been stable for 6,000 years, roughly. You know, it's risen a few feet. But before that, it was rising at 15 feet a century. I mean, that's mind boggling. Now, someone like you, Rick, who lives on a great lake, okay, actually, you're going to be in good shape because whether, and, and again, we have to educate people about their ge geography, if you will, a little bit. The Great Lakes may rise a little bit, but they're not vulnerable to sea level rise. You're hundreds of feet above sea level. In Florida here, people think that the whole state of Florida is gonna go underwater. That's not true at all. There's towns in Florida that are 200 feet above sea level. Tallahassee, the state capital, and Orlando, where everybody go, likes to go for the, you know, for the amusement parks and things like that. That's 80 feet above sea level. It's not in any danger of flooding. So it's partly getting aware and realizing that our preconceptions and misconceptions that sea level is static, that climate change is a hoax, that you know we couldn't possibly be changing the atmosphere's uh, heat retention and melting the icebergs or ice sheets, I should say. Um, we all have lots to learn. We should share it with friends and neighbors because it's when there's a growing awareness of good science, good earth science here, that that's when there will be support for adaptation and more support to get us off fossil fuels. And thanks, John. I really appreciate you taking the time to educate us on these topics today. Uh, your wealth of knowledge and the amount of outreach you've done is incredibly valuable. Um, I'll take this last, take one minute and just tell us uh, what's in the future for you. What's next? Well, as you said, my, my new book, Moving to Higher Ground, will be out April 6, 2021. Uh, there's a website about it, but it's on for pre-order at Amazon and Barnes and Noble already. And I'm excited about that. I'll be doing a speaking tour once the COVID virus problem hopefully gets under control. I, uh, my mission is really to share what I've learned in my decades of looking at sea level rise, which has changed in recent years, and really help us all plan differently for the future. And uh, it's what I'll do the rest of my life. It's something I stumbled onto. I really do think that for young people who ask what, what their career path might be, be creative. I think that um, from architecture to engineering to oceanography to uh, finance to law, all of those things are going to be affected by sea level rise. And what you and I learned when we were in school, okay, is not the knowledge for the future. We, we have new information today, and that makes it exciting to learn, and people will find ways to to marry different professions, to be an oceanographer who understands you know, law, or to be an architect who understands uh, you know, coastal uh, building regulations. And um, that, that's gonna be an investment in the future. And there's gonna be a lot of opportunity. Uh, our accounting systems will have to change. A silly example, but we don't depreciate land right now. We depreciate buildings and infrastructure. We write them off over 30 or 50 years. We leave land on our balance sheet because we thought land was permanent. 
Our accounting system is going to have to change. So some people are going to get to, to get, dig in there and figure that out. Um, this is a very profound change and it's either scary or it's exciting. And I think we have to look at the glass half full and say that like all change in life, some of it's not pretty or not what we'd want, but it's what it is and we should embrace it and we should see the opportunity ahead, which I think is uh, gonna be bigger than we can imagine. Thank you, John. I think that's a very inspiring point to leave it on. And I hope that there are um, some young students out there who are seeing the opportunity in how a lot of these professions are going to change in ways that um, you know, they can find uh, uh, their path um, by combining um, you know, some of their interests, or for example, say oceanography, but you also major in say urban planning, or, um, you know, or, or, or get into law or the other various ways and kind of think about, think about these as, as, as real opportunities and, and look towards the future. And just like 100 years ago, they built the seawall in Galveston, what do we have to contribute uh, now in our lifetimes where we'll be saving people and property 100 or 200 years from now? Yeah, thanks for your great questions and your insight as an oceanographer. And, uh, you know, for those that want to continue with this, my, if you send a, an email to slides at johnenglander.net, you can get a set of slides to use for free. And there's a weekly blog post and newsletter that I do that um, for people who want to get the latest information as I learn more. Thank you, John. I hope to talk with you again sometime soon. Okay, Rick. Thank you.